Hello everyone and welcome to the official update video for Hearts of Darkness, the making of the final Friday. I'm TJ Bowser and that is Adam, Adam Marcus. Hey guys. Yes, so we are back and here is the, the final update, the great update, the one everyone's been asking for all month long. It's, well, yeah, well, ow, every week in October, we got two or three notifications for somebody asking in our group. Yep. And, yep. Yeah. I think this is probably the best way to address everything and just answer all those questions at once. Absolutely. I, look, also, you know, I, I got to tell you, everybody, uh, beyond the fact that everybody has been so insanely patient and beautiful about this, um, everyone has every right to be like asking, like, mm -hmm. when's it happening? When's it coming? So I don't want anybody thinking like, you know, that uh, anyone on our team is annoyed or anything. We're not. No. Um, and quite frankly, a number of times it's been the case that uh, because I'm off doing stuff for this movie and other films um, that I'm not getting back to people fast enough and whatnot. And I do try to address everything personally. Um, so this was when TJ suggested, hey, why don't we just do a live and let's talk about all of it? I was like, hell yeah, let's do that. Um, because I'd rather be one on one with all of you guys than trying to somehow catch up on writing responses to everybody. So it's uh, this is actually just fantastic that we're doing this. Yes, absolutely. So we have some special guests at the beginning here. I'm going to be bringing in some of our producers to ask a couple questions to Adam directly, and then we will field questions from the people watching at home. So uh, first, we got our Amazing producer Brandon Crum coming up here. There he is. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, thanks, you guys, for having me on the show here. Thanks um, for coming, man. Thanks yeah. for being here, brother. What an honor it is to even be part of this documentary. Um, you know, you probably can maybe see a, a Jason head over there, and I've got way more yes. stuff. But that, you know, and I'm wearing the shirt. You know what I'm saying? There you are. Hell yeah, yeah. You are. <laughs> yeah, so trying to represent as much as I can here. So. Uh, but I think you guys are right. This this way right here is is the best way to kind of reach as many people that have questions as possible. Mm -hmm. um, when are we going to start asking questions? Because I know I have one. Go for mm -hmm. it, man. Excellent. <laughs> um, seeing as uh, you know, I'm a co-producer on the doc, and I made some of the animations. Yeah, you sure did. I, you know, <laughs> I'm kind of curious how much of that B-roll stuff and then people's interviews and stuff has made it into the doc, and will it be on the Blu-ray? Yeah. Um, let's put it this way. Anyone who sent us footage um, that, you know, of, of all of the producers and all of those folks, every single person is in the doc. That's oh, done. Wow. Like, that's a done deal. Um, uh, how much is in the doc varies depending on what our amazing director, Michael Felsher, decided would be best in there. Um, but I got to tell you, I mean, Eric Beatner, who's our editor on the movie and my, one of my closest friends since I was 14 years old, um, Eric is, uh, uh, he's been incredible at making sure that not only was everybody integrated into the piece, but that it was integrated to tell the story. Right. So there's nothing in there. Like we just shoved something in to go like, well, we got to put them in. <laughs> no, no. Because. Yeah. Because honestly, there were some people who would send us stuff and it didn't work. Yeah. And we'd go back to them and say, hey, guys, look, here's a couple subjects that we can have you talk about. Or here's something we need. Yeah. Um, explore oh, that. Come up with your own thing. We don't tell anybody what to say. Right. Um, but just like this is an area that we can fit you in and that it will make sense to the documentary. Or we need a way to transition from this thing to that thing. Can yeah. you give us something that would do that? So, um, no, it look, <laughs> the thing that's insane is how weirdly organic the documentary is. That's the part I that I love that. about this movie. It, it never feels like we're just jumping to a thing. Mm -hmm. It's a constant flow of information oh, um, through conversation. Oh, and that's, that's yeah, it's, it's really cool. The other thing, to answer the other part of the question that you had, is that, um, okay, so the documentary is feature length. And that was always what we were going to do. We never wanted to make a four hour documentary. That's, that's insane. <laughs> um, and I'll tell you why, because look, uh, yes, we could have just made a simple movie for the fans. Right. And this is just for people who are hardcore or the people who, who, who contributed to, to the Indiegogo campaign. And that'd be fine. 
But I, I got to tell you something. There's so much of that kind of fan service on 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 YouTube right now um, that I kind of go, well, great. Then the only people who are going to watch it are those of us that are navel gazing. And that's not the point of this. If we were going to make a movie, we're making a movie. And a movie... A movie should be, a documentary should not really be much longer than the subject it's documenting. <laughs> That's true. So, so, you know, Jason Gozell is a 90-minute movie. This is definitely coming closer to an hour, 10-minute documentary. I mean, sorry, sorry, forgive me. A, a 110-minute documentary. So closer right. to two hours, right? Okay. Yeah. That's the doc. Mm -hmm. And the documentary is made so that it can go to festivals, which it's already been invited to a bunch, um, so that it can actually have screenings, you know, in movie theaters, the way we would all love it to be, right? Conventions, oh, yeah. things like screen, that. Yeah. So, so that's the first part. Also, when it comes to streamers, yeah, you know, Shudder will take a four-hour documentary. They're thrilled, okay? Yeah. The, the people we're working with, all this, the, the people that we're dealing with are like, can we just have a feature documentary? <laughs> right. And yeah. we're thrilled to make that happen. Now, here's what's awesome. Because of the fans, right? Because of the people who are hardcore and because of my favorite people who are physical media people like myself. Oh, yeah. For those of us that love that and for the, all the fans and people in <laughs> the Indiegogo campaign who purchased a Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. dude we've got more than double what we have on oh that disc God. so it is four hours of stuff right on the disc wow that's incredible so, so you really want to get if you're a fan of this movie at all or even like curious you want yes. to pick up that disc yes you know yes so we provided we provided the whole package for for the people who are <coughs> lunatics for this stuff <laughs> but if you're gonna see a movie yeah we made a mo and i gotta tell you something you know look um we had a parting of the ways with our original director um no harm no foul truly for reasons of um artistic difference just didn't see yeah. the team just didn't see eye to eye on the vision of the movie okay 100%. that's huge that's you know yeah, exactly. But the, the point was, and, and by the way, all parties were like, cool, we get it, moving on. Mm -hmm. When we ended up working with Michael, and by the way, I was introduced to Michael through Peter Brackey, who Peter oh. Brackey is not only, you know, a producer on this movie, he's also the lead historian on the film. Big he's part of it. Con he yeah. conducted all the interviews. I mean, he's, you know, he is the voice of the movie. Um. I came to him and I said, we got to find somebody that really does have a vision to spearhead this thing. So before editing began, before it truly began, we had another director in place. And that director was Michael Felsher. Now, Michael and I, I met with directors via Zoom, right? Um, because we were still in the dark times. <laughs> and when we met, right? Um, the interaction we had within about 10 minutes of talking, Michael not only had myself, but Ali, the two of us had tears in our eyes from the way he described what the movie was and what the movie was he wanted to make out of this. And I got to tell you, he accomplished so much. It's shocking. It's shocking. The movie is so moving. Yeah. Um, it's not it, look, it's not like any other Friday 13th doc. It's not, it's just simply <laughs> yeah. not. By the way, much like Jason Goes to Hell is not like any other Friday 13th movie. That's a great point. Um, it, 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 the, this documentary is emotional and funny. God, is it funny? Um, I would have never called Bob Kurtzman hilarious until this documentary. <laughs> oh, he is okay. flat out funny in this thing. Oh. Um, there, there are, I mean, Stephen Williams is his usual insane self. Kane is wonderful. And again, very funny, not in the way he is with people at conventions, because he's always funny, like Kane's oh, a funny yeah. guy. But there's an openness to him about this. And the other thing is, everybody is so raw. Like, there's no, there's no filter. But I got to tell you something, there's still like a love for the movie that comes out in ways, I mean, <laughs> Stephen Culp 
is very critical of the movie and didn't want to do the documentary originally oh. because like i don't want to be involved in the puff piece i don't want to that's not what i want to do yeah and and i said steven <clears throat> I said i can be there or not be there that's your choice right you choose whether you want me in the room with you because i want you to be completely open and i want you to say whatever you want to say about me i i have no right. uh, look i mean I made Jason goes to hell. I'm Teflon at this point. Like, you, you can't, <laughs> it's very hard to offend me at this point. I'm like, uh huh. Oh there yeah. Are, okay. Like, oh, I should fuck my mother and get <laughs> cancer. Okay, I got it. I, uh -huh, okay. Um, you know, literally yesterday, someone called me a fat nepo baby on Twitter. Jesus. Oh, what the hell? And I literally was like, oh, it's Wednesday. <laughs> like I'm not, you know, like uh huh, okay, and 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 what do you, and what do you do, you know, like I, right. you know, I don't come down to where you work and slap no. your mother's dick out of your mouth. So no. <laughs> here's the thing. Um, I I am uh, truly I'm I'm not. Um, I I wanted I wanted this movie to be like raw and open and people to say exactly what they wanted to say, and so like a guy like Stephen Culp said some stuff that I was like, oh, Steven, dude. But then, but then he revealed like what this movie actually meant to me. Like really? really what it meant to me, you know? Do we get to find that out now or do we got to wait? No, you got to wait. You got to wait. Uh -huh. Always a tease. I love because, it. because I got to <laughs> tell you, it, it surprised me. It really surprised me. The number of people whose lives changed dramatically because they decided to do this movie. And by the way, not one of them for bad. It was all for good. That's what was so crazy about You're this You're saying thing. this movie has not necessarily opened old wounds, but it's healed maybe old wounds. Is that maybe? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I got to say, you know, these are all people that I had not spoken to since, I mean, most of them I haven't seen since the movie. Like, oh, that's not true. I, I saw, I saw a lot of them at, at, uh, when Peter put out his book and we were all at Universal, uh, for the Friday 13th, 25th anniversary, I, I was there for, for that. And we all signed the books together and all that. So I did see a lot of them. That's where, where Carrie Keegan and I kind of buried the hatchet, which was great. Oh, that's um, funny. So, so that was all good, but no, but most of them I have not seen, like, I, I really haven't seen, um, you know, Allison Smith or M Michelle uh, Clooney, who both, by the way, for the very first time talked about this movie. Neither of them had ever been interviewed about this film, ever. Michelle okay. Clooney had never seen her actual uncut version of the scene that she's in. And she watches it on camera in the movie <laughs> and reacts to it. Oh, that's gonna be that's a treasure right there. That's but that's what I'm saying. Like the movie is so full of like unexpected, like like here's the thing. You know, people are like, oh, can I see where you shot the movie? And I'm like, I can show you an empty parking lot where there's no <laughs> building anymore. Like, okay, we can yeah. do that. I mean, uh huh. <laughs> and it's right down the road, so big whoop. Yeah. But again. I immediately went to YouTube and I was like, if I can find it on YouTube, why are we putting it in the movie? What's the point? That's like, great. that's not, that's not, that's nothing new. When you see Michelle Clooney looking at her, at her tape yeah. and going, oh my God, it was so hot then. <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, she's gorgeous. Like she's yeah. she is stop a clock beautiful right now. And her reaction to it is like, oh, and I'm like, that's amazing. Like you're amazing. Um, and and the other thing is, look, we shot almost everybody in their homes. Oh, that's good. So we went to people's environments, which by the way is why COVID hit us so hard. Um, we had shot 29 interviews right before the COVID clock hit. Okay. Wow. We were in 20, we were, we were, we had 29 amazing, raw, beautiful. I mean, we're in Kane Hodder's home. We're in Stephen wow. Williams' home. We're not, we're not, we weren't playing. Like, we're like, no, oh. we want people to feel completely um open and ready to talk and and feel like they're in their they're in their own environment. So they don't have to pretend with us. They can just be who they are. And that was amazing, right? Yeah. Um, so, raw, real stuff there, you know? Yes. You feel comfortable. Yes. 
So um, for me, uh, the, the, the movie, the movie is such an exploration of the emotional value of the movie and the people who helped make it. And that's what's incredible about the doc. I love it. Uh, I, I don't think anybody's asked this yet. Did we get Mr. Cunningham in it? Was he any? We we, <laughs> we did not. Um, okay. I got to tell you, we 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 made several attempts to to get Sean. He yeah. never even responded. Well, well, he is kind of in it. Yes, he, do. <laughs> <laughs> he does make a couple of appearances. By the way, he does. There is one extra on the disc. Yeah. Um, that is that goes into much more of the dark side of all of that. Right. Okay. Yeah. But it is it is a piece. It's a ten minute piece, eleven minute piece on the disc. Oh wow! Um, great. And it is it is dark. It that yeah. is dark. Yeah. Um. But again, but again, no one again. The, the the movie is not about mud throwing. Right. Because no. that's not that's not the point of it either. The movie we didn't do anything in there. Yeah. That would be considered low blows let's put it this way okay like i told you earlier about that you know some guy on twitter calling me yeah. a reprobate um here's the thing i hate that culture i i hate that crap i just hate it i put up with it and a lot of times i'll engage somebody who's being nasty and just talk to them and and find yeah. out why are you so angry like uh, it's a movie. It, it, right. it, didn't, yeah. it didn't harm your sister. It's a movie. You know, <laughs> right. you, don't, you don't have to go all Liam Neeson on me. No. I didn't kidnap anyone. I made a movie. Yeah. And you're really attached to why you're so angry. Like, why? Like, let's talk about it. Why are you this pissed? Yeah. So I usually go there. Here's the thing I don't want to make a movie that's that. I don't want to, I'm, I'm no right. interest in producing a film that's like, hey, you know, let's, let's talk about grievances. Oh, stop it. Just stop. <laughs> Do we talk about the dark side of the movie? You bet we do. Um, but it's but it's done in a much more positive way. Hey! Howdy, howdy. Howdy, howdy. How are you? Look at these sexy son funny. of a guns. Look at you. Look at For you. those who don't know who that saucy Aussie is, that would be one of our other producers, Brody Kane. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for having me on, gentlemen. I'll only quickly pop on to say a good hello and listen to you ramble on for a little bit. Thanks for having me. It's great <laughs> to be here. I'm so thrilled you're here. Nah, yeah, TJ sort of threw it at me, and I was like, yeah, kind of a bit nervous. So, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. This is the – welcome to the Bearded Guy Club. So, it's, <laughs> pretty much, it's our pretty safe much, space. Mate. It's our safe space. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, dude. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you got any questions, brother? Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, not really off the top of me bloody head there, mate. Okay. But, um, no like I said, it was just kind of just throwing at me. <laughs> well, I love um, it. I love it. Uh, I'm just sort of here to, yeah, listen to you. Maybe once you uh, keep going, I'll have a couple of questions of my own. I love it. Um, I love it. I have yeah. a question. Is yeah. there commentary? Do you give your, you know, like DVDs, Blu-rays have commentary sometimes. Did you did you record one for this? I know people we, are going to ask. We are. We're, we're talking about recording a commentary track right now. We haven't okay. yet um, because right now the movie is in legal. So oh. um, right now, Larry Zerner has the film. How incredible um, is that? Larry has to go through it with a fine-tooth comb. That's what mm -hmm. he gets paid for as a lawyer. Um, and make sure that there's nothing in there that anybody can go, oh, they're going to sue you for everything you have. Um, so we're making sure none of that is there. there. There really isn't. I mean, the movie is, again, as I said, there's no, um, there's no low blows. There's no pot shots. Is it? We're just not doing it. Um, and, uh, and I will say they are really constructing, we're constructing something that is sound as a drum because we know how litigious one Mr. Cunningham is. And I'm not giving him any room to do that. No, no. I'm just not, yeah. not going to do it not gonna do it so uh no we're, we're we're we keep it positive but we keep it <laughs> we keep all the information in there it is it is really kind of uh it, it, it again it's four hours of stuff it's insane it's so much footage and i will say i know everything that's in there and when i'm watching it and i've had to watch it several times and several cuts and all the extras and all that stuff i <clears throat> i'm never bored like i'm like okay i like I'm the easiest one to get bored listening to myself, listening to hey, people. You're part of the like, adventure, oh, yeah. God. And <laughs> I'm like, no, it's really, um, it's fresh and it's interesting, and um, and it's a cool story. Like it's just a really interesting, cool story. I will say, 
Um, <clears throat> we got uh, Mark Rodeski from New Line, who, oh. for anybody who follows producers, um, Mark is the guy responsible for Lord of the Rings happening at New Line. He's the one who ushered the deal, and then he was the guy on set every single day of that of that entire series of movies. Wow. Um, and he's an amazing guy. My film, I think, was the first movie he was a he was an executive on from from the standpoint of being a point person at New Line. Um, him and Mike DeLuca, and Mark Mark came out and talked to us for a bit. Um, it's so amazing to hear the studio side of what was happening mm -hmm. during the, the making of the movie. Like, it's fascinating. And the other part of it is, and I will give a little bit of this, and, and this is in that little extra that I talked about, but exclusive. I will, I will talk about it. Exclusive. It is exclusive. <laughs> it is exclusive. Uh, so Sean um, loved to say, and he, he still says, and uh, in fact, TJ um, witnessed, uh, bore witness to this exact <laughs> thing. Um, he loves to say that he reshot 60% of my film. <laughs> every single actor, every single technician, and then the, the point person, producer, executive at New Line was asked the question, hey, do you remember Sean on set? <laughs> That's the answer for most people. It's like... <laughs> Wait a minute. And what? some of Sean's closest friends, people like Harry Manfredini, people like Andy Block, people who love Sean, because again, I'm not Sean bashing. This is, I want, I want, and he, and I say lovely things about Sean, and so do other people in the movie. So it's, it's not that film. But every one of them is like, no, you, no, he wasn't there. What are you talking about? <laughs> wow. And I ask the campers, um, because he always says that he shot the reshoots, and I'm like, so. Who, you know, how, how did you enjoy working with Sean? And they're like, I never worked with Sean, so I don't know. <laughs> That's so, a great revelation there then. Right. So it's, it, and it, it, it's simply asking questions and seeing how they responded. Because if somebody said, oh, well, that time he came in direct for you. Yeah, even just once. Yeah. No one. <laughs> wow. So we gave everybody that option, yet there was one uh, editor who thought Sean had had shot a bunch of the footage because he wasn't there on set. He was <laughs> no, in an editing room yeah. and he was told that. So he thought, yeah. oh, well, of course, Sean must have done this. Yeah. The cinematographer, Bill Dill, who shot every frame of footage for the movie, tells a story about being asked by Sean to come and shoot for him without me for the, for the reshoots or the additionals. We never reshot anything. We just shot yeah. additionals. Um, and Bill Dill says, um, no. Why would yeah. I do that? You're not the director of the movie. I, I only come for the director and my crew only comes for the director. So um, if Adam's there, we'll be there, of course. But no, I'm not. No, we're not doing that. And that was it. Like, yeah. that was the end of that idea. It ended that moment. And Sean went, oh, oops. <laughs> um, and truly, That's like cool. he he even Bill even went to New Line and was like, This is Adam's movie, right? New Line was like, Yeah, of course it is. Why? So even this idea hadn't been floated by New Line. Yeah. So it it's um the movie does things in a way that keeps it above board, that's not sneaky, that's not nasty, but that that paints this picture and sets the record straight. Um, it's really uh -oh. cool, guys. And again, and again, I've been teasing this the whole time, and I will not give it away now, but I will say everyone has to stay through the whole credits. And the credits <laughs> oh. Oh, Everybody's got to stay through the credits because there is a piece of information. The dead last thing of this movie is a vindication for myself and for much of my team that is so spectacular, that is so uh, earth shattering and when we get to it i'm telling you like even people that i've screened the movie for here in la they gasp when it when it comes up wow. so it's yes yes so the movie has we did like a little bit of a marvel movie thing where we're like no no mm -hmm. no after the credits there's a must-see thing mostly uh -huh. because i want people to sit through the, the credits i want everybody must to look at good. every single thank you yeah. that goes by for people who contributed to this movie and made the movie happen. Like, I'm sorry. I, no, you should look at all that stuff. You shouldn't just shoot past it. Plus, uh, we got a song um, from this. Uh, this ah, um, yes. 
Yes. yes. We got a song um, uh, that was gifted to the film um, that uh, is right now trending number one. It's a dance hit uh, uh, called Massacre um, by Lil Tokyo. Uh, and this amazing uh, producer named Verge. This guy is so good. And they brought me the – now, here's the thing. I've been given probably about 30 pieces of music since we started this thing. People sending me tracks and going like, hey, I'd love to have the, this song in the movie, right? And I'm like, great. And I listen to everything. The problem is I open up <laughs> title after title, and it's always like death metal. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, not quite the vibe of the movie. Not really get a mix. And the and the director is like, what is this? Because I pass everything on. Like I listen to it, I give it to the team, and the director's like, Adam, I can't, I can't put this mm -hmm. in the movie. And again, some of it's awesome. Some of it's like oh, oh, so, yeah. like metal and thrashing and amazing. But I'm like, no, this can't work. So then I get this song Massacre from this from from Verge. And he sends it to me. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, it's called Massacre. It's just gonna be just really loud <laughs> so i put the thing on and suddenly this like amazing track with this insane hook starts playing and then it's a hip-hop thing with rap in it but the rapper is female and she's spitting fire oh, and it was like what is happening right now um it's so good and the two women who sing on the piece who rap and then sing on the piece both of their their solo albums snoop dogg contributed to Wow. So I'm like these are legit artists. These are great yeah. artists, right? And and he and I was like, yeah, dude, we're, yes, we're gonna, yeah, this will go in the in the movie. This has to go in the movie. This is terrific. It just fits everything <laughs> too well, you know, like the the aesthetic. It really does. It really does. Um, and I will also say, um, uh, as as a because I don't think anybody's gonna ask this question, but I will I will bring it out. Um, you know, Brandon uh, contributed to some of the animations in the movie, mm -hmm. some of the the stills animated in the film. Uh, Brandon and I did all of that work, you and I together. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, and I've done like hundreds more. It's been yeah. stupid. Oh, like, it's <laughs> stupid. Um, and at first it was for legal reasons. It turned into this aesthetic thing that the movie has got this almost like kid stays in the picture vibe, that documentary mm -hmm. uh, about uh, Robert Evans. So really, really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. But because of that, I was like, man, I really want our, our front end sequence to be like amazing, right? I want our credits, our opening credits to be really cool. Yes, and, and, tell them all about that. <laughs> this, is, this, is this is insane. This is insane, actually. Um, so a, uh, a guy named Declan, Declan Boyle, um, who's, who's a lovely guy, he, uh, he sends me a credit sequence. And I never asked for it. I never went out to the fans. I never went out to anybody saying, hey, can anybody do credits? Anybody want to, you know, jump in and do something? I was planning I was going to do the, you know, the credits. I'm like, I'll, I'll animate it. I can do it. And uh, he sends me this thing that is almost like an NES version of the titles for this movie, right? Oh, that sounds good. And it's badass, right? It's really good. It's really good. Problem is, again doesn't quite fit the tone of what Michael has created. It's not right. It, it doesn't work. The piece is so good that there are going to be clips of that, that credit sequence in the extras at the end of the disc at the, you know, the, the, oh, the, right. the two hours of extra, extra nonsense, which is just so good. Um, so he made this thing and I was like, it's brilliant. I showed it to the whole team. Everybody's like, this guy's amazing. Like we love this sequence. Just, it just doesn't fit. So we go back to him and say, Hey, Declan, we love this. It's just not going to work for the vibe. Can we, can, if you're interested in doing the titles on this, we'd love to have your work in it. We think you're doing great stuff. He's like, no problem. So <clears throat> he takes another crack at it. But before we get to give him a lot of direction, he's just sort of given like a little bit of a vibe, but not direction on it. He sends back another sequence of a couple weeks later, and it totally doesn't work. Like does not work. <laughs> Yeah. But the art, the artist's eye is so good. I was like, I was like, this guy can do this job. I know he can. He's amazing. Like, this guy is just badass. So I said, Deck, is there any way that you and I can get on Zoom together and actually have a conversation? Now, he's in Ireland, for God's sakes. Oh, okay. wow. Um, so just lining up our time, time slots to get on Zoom was like a whole thing. But we get on Zoom together. 
And uh, I've got some of the team with me the first time. And we're talking and I'm telling him, look, I love what you're doing. And by the way, this guy is in like a, an attic of a house in Ireland that has one open window kind of area that's letting the only light in the room in. Oh. So I'm immediately like, okay, this guy is in a dark space in the <laughs> attic of his house um, doing, you know, doing God knows what kind of stuff at his computer, right? I'm like, who is this guy? Like, I still don't know who you are, Declan. Like, you're this <laughs> mad genius who's up in an attic? What is going on? So, uh, so as we're talking, I describe what I want. I describe what what my, what Michael and I and Eric and the whole team, Brian and Allie and Deborah, I'm like, this is what we're talking about. And I'm a huge Saul Bass fan, right? As I'm sure all of you guys are. Um, his titles at the beginning of all of Hitchcock stuff, uh, at the beginning of Taxi Driver, at the beginning of so many remarkable films, he's amazing. And he had certain students of his that went on to make even more incredible titles that were inspired by, by Saul. So <clears throat> Declan says, can you give me a couple of examples of what you're thinking about? I said, sure. And I sent him a whole bunch of stuff. Out of this whole bunch of stuff is one particular set of titles that is insane and the most artistic of all of them. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever seen Catch Me If You Can. You probably have. The opening title sequence of that movie, if you remember, is a completely animated title sequence mm -hmm. that is jaw-dropping, okay? And Declan says to me, I, um, I like to catch me if you can one. I, I think I want to try to do that. I was like, Deck, listen, I just sent it as an example. I'm not, I'm not expecting you to do that. He goes, no, 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 that's, that's the one I want to do. I said, Declan, I got to ask you something. Do you do this for a living? Is this what you do? And he says, well, yeah, kind of. Um, <laughs> I'm a visual effects guy. I, you know, I do visual effects. So I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, Deck, this is great. I said, uh, because at Skeleton Crew, we've been actually been looking for a visual effects person. We've had people along the way that we love, but that really can't keep up and can't do the, the level of work. And the stuff you're doing is beautiful. Can you send me your reel? I'd love to look at your reel. He goes, oh, I'd be thrilled. That would be amazing. Like, I would love to send you the reel. I said, great. He sends me his reel and he says, listen, forgive me, um, because a lot of the reel, because I just updated, but a lot of it is Evil Dead Rises. And I was like, wow. it's what? <laughs> <laughs> He sends me the reel. Guys, this guy did some of the best shots in the movie. And by the way, stuff that I swore, swore was physical effects, was done on set, and it wasn't. That's how good this dude is. Okay? So then he sends me the first run of the new titles. Okay? This is not a joke. I had people in my production team sobbing, looking at the titles, sobbing, wow. actually crying from the titles because we are all so overworked. It's been four years. Yeah. <laughs> we're exhausted. And when we, and when, when someone actually brings like a thing of beauty to the movie, we're like, ah, ah, ah. this guy's titles were so unbelievable that I said to him, I said, Declan, you're only missing, you're missing. There were a couple of corrections we need to make. I said, you're missing one title, one title. He says, what? I said, lead title designer that has to be in the front credits and he's like oh no 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 no!" i was like oh yeah 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 you earned it like this is yeah, your yeah. name needs to be at the front of this movie because you just created a work of art um no joke and by the way i had suggestions off of this masterpiece he did a masterpiece and i was like wow hey dude um any way that you can add this to it can you change this can you put in this thing and he was like yeah, I'll need a couple of weeks. I was like, no problem. I'll give you whatever time you need. Just, 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 if you can make that happen, it'd be amazing. Two days later, I would receive the new <laughs> animations. I'm like, and he's like, yeah, I'm doing it between other gigs, you know, my studio gig. I'm like, uh huh. Wow. So we have jaw dropping titles. And by the way, <clears throat> then he, then my editor says, any way he can do the lower thirds and animate people's names? <laughs> thing? We called him up. Declan was like, no problem. I'm on. Uh -huh. So it's, here's the thing. And by the way, Brandon, this also goes to you a little bit, my man. What's been amazing about this 
whether it be people sending in footage of testimonials about the movie or how they felt initially. There's one guy, one of our guys hated the movie when he first saw it and talks about it and it's in the movie. <laughs> and, and then his turnaround and when that happened and why it happened, it's in the yeah. movie. The, the, the way people open themselves up and then the amount of people who just wanted to contribute in a, in a, in a bigger way and really be a part of the movie. And everybody is credited for that. Nobody got paid. I mean, we paid, look, we paid our, our crew that was on the, you know, in the field. We paid for our equipment. This is what all the Indiegogo money. Again, not one person in production has been paid a dollar, nothing. We've literally just come out of pocket and handed people cash. That's from our own pockets. <laughs> um, but it was, it was astounding to me how many people who were already producers on the film, who'd already contributed to the movie to get the movie made, how many of those folks came forward and said, hey, can I do this for the movie? Can I help with that? I'm good at this thing. Do you need any help? Yeah, we sure do. So um, the, the most remarkable thing about this is, you know, not only was I blessed with the cast and crew I had on the movie, which has been astounding to revisit with all of them, but the, the cast and crew of the doc has become just as much of a family to me. And that's unexpected. I did not expect that to happen on this documentary. And it really has. And that's... Um, that is an incredible thing, guys. That's an incredible thing. And Brandon, you're a big part of that, man. You really are. Well, thank you. I mean, yeah. I think most of it is just everybody that did contribute. We're so we're so much fans of, you know, one, the movie and also the franchise itself. Yep. It's just something that we a lot of us grew up with. I think at least my generation and stuff. It's like, you know, right in the 90s when this came out, I was coming of age when the horror movies were in, now in my, you know, in my view and I right. had access. And this was the one, you know, this is the one that kind of opened all our eyes. So it's just something special to us. So we wanted to you know kind of become part of it so thank you for the opportunity oh, absolutely dude absolutely it's been a dream absolutely man yeah for yeah, me yeah, yeah. and everybody involved really you know i hope so i hope so i and i and i hope the burger you know all of us yeah i oh no ellie oh no. yeah noelle's great oh my god my little sister um <laughs> yeah. uh and i gotta say uh you know joe horak was on here i don't know if you guys uh joe came late to the party um and uh became an executive producer <clears throat> uh contributed five thousand dollars to the movie um him and his daughter lydia who over the time of making this film for the last year and a half which is when they jumped in um they are like part of my family now these two people they're oh, on the, this little girl who is the youngest producer that i've ever worked with um she's so beautiful ah there he is there's yep. joe um uh he, these people are so like wonderful doesn't cover it. Um, and I'm not talking about the contribution. That's amazing. Like that just helps us make the movie, but it, it's the humanity of each person that's been involved with this thing. That's what's so freaking cool. Um, that's what's so unexpected. And when I, when I hear from people and it, it's why I try to get back to everybody personally, because I'm like, yeah, it's exhausting for me because remember there's almost a thousand of you guys. Who, who got involved with this project. So it's a thousand people I'm answering to pretty regularly. <laughs> yeah. um, that's a lot. Like that's, that's a lot. Um, I used to do it just on my birthday. When people would send me birthday messages, I always send a birthday message, like a, a thank you back person yeah. to each person. I try to do that. Um, now it's like a weekly thing. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so tired. <laughs> um, but, but I got to tell you, it it feels like, um, and every city that I go to, whenever I'm doing conventions and all that, every city I'm in, somebody who's who contributed to this campaign walks up to my table every time. And I'm just oh, stunned. I'm like, my God, it doesn't matter where I go. Hellions are everywhere. And oh, that no. is so cool. Like, I, I again, because when I go to conventions, trust me, there are some people wishing me ass cancer there, too. <laughs> Great fun. Great fun. Um, but it's pretty awesome when you know you've got people who are on the line as well who are going to give that person some shit. And I'm like, I don't even have to talk. This is great. Right. <laughs> go for it. You guys handle it. Yeah, we are. We really have become sort of a Jason Goes to Hell army like that. Yeah. Uh, yep. I have that shirt too, but I'm not wearing it. I like this one better. But I love that, great. dude. I love that shirt. Corey, Corey killed it on that shirt. Yes. That's insane. That uh, 
that was actually, I think TJ was the one who originally suggested it, right? Brother? Yes, Brother? both yes. both those designs. The one that you're wearing right now, Brandon, came yeah. to me in the shower. Yep. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> yep. And oh, then I told him, and I immediately was like, Adam, I have this idea. And he's like, make it happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Now, so, are these shirts still available? I know Indiegogo, right? Yep. Uh, they are. We get the Blu ray. I know that's a question people are going to ask. Yep. Um, where do I get this? The, right now, the Indiegogo, I think, is where you get this. That's where you get it. Mm -hmm. The Blu-rays, all that stuff. I think there's still some other fun stuff there. Yeah, it's, it, all, all of that stuff yes. is still live. The one thing that we that is no longer live is the DVD. We killed mm -hmm. it because there were too few people who ordered it. And to get a DVD pressed would have cost production so much money. Yeah. So, I, so I'm literally giving everybody who ordered a DVD, I'm giving them a Blu-ray. Like that's like, even though they paid less money for it, I'm like, I, I don't care. Yeah. Take a blue, like you're going to get a Blu-ray. <laughs> um, so I upgraded everybody who had done that simply because I was like, this, it, it doesn't make any sense to us production wise. Now the VHSs are still going to get made, even though those are really expensive to make, but that was a specialty item that we were psyched about. And, you yeah. know, it has the fire, uh, the fire uh, plastic, so it looks oh, like yeah. it's on fire, you know, and stuff. it's great. Um, so we're still doing all that. But uh, no, I mean, all the, the cool stuff. Will you be able to order it on Amazon? I see just came up from Seth. Good question. Um, I don't know, Seth. I don't know. It that, might only be exclusive. That, a lot of factors go into that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, but look, here's the thing. I will make sure that even once the movie comes out, if the Indiegogo page is shut down at that point, which it probably will be, um we skeleton crew will make sure that there are extra you know a thousand extra copies of this of this disc that we can get to people um because look the disc is going to be different than anything else you can mm -hmm. see anywhere else so we're not releasing the extras to a streamer we're releasing the movie to the streamers um and uh and by the way for anybody out there that that hasn't heard the news yet or if you are or, or if you have heard it but don't know if it affects us or not it does you know the strike just ended mm -hmm. um our writers guild strike ended which i'm a, a guild member writers guild strike ended a few weeks ago but the sag strike ended yesterday and i can tell you how exciting it is um for independent filmmakers like myself because all of that goodness, all the money that those actors received and that the writers are receiving, and I'm a member of both unions, I'm SAG and I'm Writers Guild, um, it's all going to make its way through to independent production. And it's allowing us to make things and make sure that the people who are in our movies are able to get paid and to get paid a living wage. Not Nobody's getting rich off these movies. Nobody. Um, this is truly so that people can feed their families. Um, and, uh, and so it's an amazing day. I'm so glad we're doing this today and not yesterday because I wouldn't have had the news yet. Uh, but it oh, broke yeah. last night and, you know, Fran Drescher and the SAG team, they killed it. They stayed, they, they held, Ooh. they held strong. They didn't take any kind of low deal. Um, and again, you know, people think that all of us, like everybody in Hollywood makes all this money. It's like, it's not true. There's like eight guys who make a lot of money and Tom Cruise, that's it. And by the way, <laughs> Tom Cruise earns every penny. He does. Right. No, yeah, yeah. Um, the other eight guys, not so sure about, but now, you know, <clears throat> people who used to make a living as an actor who could actually like call that their career and their job and not have to wait tables at night or be an accountant in the morning and then actor when they got the chance. Now those folks um, can can live a life in that profession. By the way, I mean, yeah, and, and again, I'm sure you guys know, but for the for the you know for the population out there, um, you know, Ned Eisenberg, who plays Eddie in The Burning, so that's the easiest reference for people. Ned Eisenberg uh, was my uncle. Um, Ned passed away a year and a half ago, um, and uh, and I got to tell you. Uh, he was a he was a that guy. If you see him, you're like, oh, that guy. He's he's in like every sixth Law and Order. There's Ned as a he's as that a one, that guy from that one thing. He's that guy. Yeah. Um, he's J.K. Simmons before everybody knew the name J.K. Simmons. Um, <laughs> before before Whiplash, he's J.K. Simmons before Whiplash. Uh, and the thing is, is that even he was like he left Manhattan. He had to move out of Manhattan. He's like, an actor can't live here anymore. And my uncle was on Broadway every year. My uncle was in two shows that won the Tony for best show. Wow. And he couldn't afford to live in Manhattan. That's crazy. 
You know, I mean, by the way, God bless Dick Wolf because he always paid people the right dun, amount dun. of money and he always paid their yeah. rate and he always <laughs> paid residuals. So God oh, bless Dick Wolf. Dude. But yeah, so no, it's a huge day for our industry. And in that, this movie will have a chance of getting a foothold that it wasn't able to get before. And that's an amazing thing. And by the way, it's also why we have not rushed to get the thing out. Everybody always thinks like, oh, just put it out on Blu-ray. No. No, then it has no legs. Then no one outside of our tight group is ever going to get to see the thing. No. It does, it does. Movies don't work that way. I know that here's the problem. And again, here's the problem. Because of the number of fan films that are out there, right? Like Vin DeSanti, who's in the documentary, and he's terrific. Vin is able to have a pipeline that goes straight through to the audience because he can't make money on that movie. He can't actually amortize that film. And there's so, uh, Shudder's not going to pick up Never Hike Alone. They Bingo. can't. Yeah. They can't. Legally, they can't do it, right? This is not that movie. This is a movie that's going to be, you know, fully legal mm -hmm. where we can actually put, will it play in theaters? Oh, dude. Well, it'll play at festivals. I know that. Um, Again, it, it's the same thing with like the Amazon question. A whole bunch of factors play into that. Yep. Yep. Is that the same with Shutter and all that. The, that's know. yes. 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 Yeah. That's that's the thing. We're we're we are now working with a number of people who who have all expressed interest. interest in wanting the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, I great. can't say who. I can say this though. I can't say this because this has been a door that's open that's been really lovely. Um, I I don't know how many people out there have Screenbox yet, but I'm telling you, get it. Uh, one for very one for very selfish reasons. Uh, but Secret Santa just two days ago, Secret Santa made its North American debut um, on a streamer, uh, and it was the first time. And the only reason we've been asked by all the streamers for the movie, we wouldn't do it because the deal was so bad. We're like, basically, we we have to pay them to be on. I'm like, get out it, no man. What yeah, really what is good. wrong with the world? Bit of a movie for that anyway. But thank you, thank yeah. you. But they came to us and they they had seen the film and were like, who owns the rights to this? I was like, well, we do. Um, and they made a deal with us that was beautiful and fair and amazing. And they are amazing. Um, great company to work with. Michael Felsher is doing like four things with them right now. Um, they are like legit. By the way, they didn't just grab the document. They didn't just grab the movie Secret Santa. They grabbed the documentary about the making of Secret Santa. Oh, which is a feature length documentary. So they put all of that stuff on their on their platform. Um they're amazing, man. So there they, there are companies out there now who are realizing the responsibility of the artists and the responsibility of material and how to get it to an audience. And to do it fairly where the filmmakers are not, you know, getting, you know, raped. Big you. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah. Which is what's um, happening to a lot of us. Very true. I yeah. do have another question. I, I'm full of questions here. That's Love okay. It. Love it. Um, <clears throat> near the ending of the film, Jason goes to hell. You maybe have sort of started this whole horror cross universe thing. I don't want to, you know, sure. we'll see who gives to the credit. But sure. do you talk about Freddy's laugh in the doc at all? Um, yes, that does get brought up. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Freddy's yeah. laugh does get brought up. You and know, and, and, and and Kane, uh, Kane did not do the laugh, but Kane does. Um, he does take a lot of credit for being the only guy to play not only Jason and Leatherface, but Freddy, because yeah. he is his arm. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And 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 Robert has to take a lot of shit from from. Kane. <laughs> so it's pretty funny. It's pretty right. great. It's pretty great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is Robert yeah. in the docket? Our he is not. Oh, he, he is. is. Not. He is not oh. in in oh. the doc. No. I think he was. No, 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 no. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, look, uh, again, it was one of those things where it was like, we were going to ask Robert two questions and bother him with that for, for what? For, for one joke? Right. Nah, nah, nah I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Um, we did, look, I will tell you, you know, Absolutely. people like Larry Zerner were, we did put Larry in front of camera and he was like, why? I'm not in this. I was like, no, but you, <laughs> but, you're, but you're the guy responsible for bringing the mask into the movie. And I'm the guy who took the mask out of the movie for, Bingo. you know, yeah. for 65 minutes. Um, and that is explored. Trust me. We oh, talk good. about that a lot. <laughs> uh, but I will say, look, beyond the fact that, you know, Alison Smith, first time she's ever talked about the movie, Rusty mm -hmm. Schwimmer, first time she's ever talked about the movie, the Michelle best. Clooney, first time. 
Catherine Atwood first time. John LeMay, who does not do interviews at all and hasn't done an interview about anything in decades, he decided to do it. And that was not easy to get him. John was a holdout. John was not immediate. It was like, I, I had to sweat that one out. And oh. I will tell you, um, uh, Cody Newton, uh, who's a wonderful cinematographer, he's the one who went to John's, where John lives, and actually shot him and put him at ease because he knows Cody. There was the, It was so wonderful. It was like, and, and then John, and I interviewed John directly. I didn't have anybody else involved. He didn't want anybody else involved. He just wanted to talk to me. And it was amazing because like two cousins talking about about this right. stuff, you know. Um, yeah, John's John is wonderful in the doc, and again, he talks about the dark side of it too. He talks about sort of you know some of the hate and some of the stuff that's gone on for him over the movie. Um, it's I got it, you guys. You you just don't know what's coming. It's <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Like I'm thinking about scenes in the movie, and it makes me giggle because I'm like, it's so good. It's so good. I can't wait. Yep. Seth asked, yep. did Robert England get asked to play Freddy in Jason Goes to Hell? No, he did not. We could not afford uh, to pay Robert a million dollars to show up to put his arms <laughs> so, through a floorboard. That was not going to happen. I um, have been pending some questions. So yes, Seth do it. I love it. Asked, yes. I went yeah. to ask if there's any bloopers. Ah. Uh, there are. There are. They're, they're almost unintentional. So, okay. So one of the things that, that I've held back, but that I can definitely give you guys today uh, by the way, Jimmy Rusty is great. Um, one of the things I can tell you is that uh, so there was no um, EPK, electronic press kit, of Jason Goes to Hell. There was never a day when we had another crew on set shooting footage so that they could do a behind the scenes of Jason Goes to Hell because it was Jason Goes to Hell. That's not what they did on Friday 13th movies. They just didn't have another team of people. And we were at New Line. And what most people don't really understand is that, you know, Jason Goes to Hell got made for way less money than most of the Paramount movies got made for. Half and of those were eight, low budget. What? Half, half of the budget of eight. Yes. 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 So we were a $2.4 million movie. Yep. <laughs> um, and by the way, out of the $2.4 million, a bunch of that had to come out for rights. Well, what? So, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh I made that God. movie for nothing. <laughs> OK, <clears throat> really for nothing. And by the way, that also tells you how good a line producer Sean Cunningham is and his his UPM, Deborah Hain Cass, who was amazing. Brody, hold um, up the sign. That's a sign. I think it's to us. I had there to it write is. it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> hey, for writing it backwards. Yes. Oh, wow. You see, it started running out of room. But yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Awesome craft that is amazing, dude. The wow. visual gag. Um, that is so good. But I got to say, I got to say, when you realize how much we made the movie for, you go, you know, if Sean wasn't so um, personally, if he wasn't a bully, he's a bully. He's just an angry guy. Uh, can bully. I give an example? Please. Do. So, for, for example, I had a very personal interaction with Mr. Cunningham, and I had one of my booths for Project Louder at a convention, and he was walking out of a Q&A, which I harassed him at and stuff. That's a story for another day. You guys will hear it. Uh, so he comes past my table, and he stops, and he comes up to me, and he pulls down his glasses, and he's with his handler. And Sean is deceptively small. I mean, deceptively yes. small. Very yes. small man. Very he he looks up, and he looks over his glasses, and he looks at the banner on my booth and it's the Jason uh, Jason is dead two for one burger sale banner the same replica one for one replica Adams had it in his office for a while it's okay. fantastic yes beautiful and he goes did i make that movie and <laughs> i was like what he goes that the one that that's from did i make that one i said yeah it's jason goes to hell oh okay and then walks away huh very strange yeah, very odd interaction. Yes, yes. Here's the thing. Given all of that, and I agree with your sign, Brody. Um, <laughs> given given all of that, he he. And again, to give the devil their due, and I always do. The guy is an amazing line producer. If I needed it on set, it happened. If I needed to get a shot done, it got done. 
Um, I had to take all kinds of shit. Every time I tried to do anything artistic, I was called a fucking film student. Um, it was all that stuff, but he still gave me the tools to make the movie and to make it work. And he put me in the room with professionals that were extraordinary that yes, I had to hire them, but he, he gave me access to people. Look, I met K and B because of Sean. Now, and he allowed a John Woo action scene in a Friday the 13th movie. He did. He did. <laughs> he, did. He, didn't, he didn't like that I was doing it, but he let me do it. Um, uh, he, please, when I brought out a steady cam for the opening of that, of the first diner scene, he looked at me like I was insane. Uh, like I was insane. He's like, this is a Friday 13th movie. What are you doing? I was like, um, shooting it artfully. <laughs> all right. Is that all right? Is it okay if I make it look right. good? Can I do that? Is that all right? Um, so so look, he he did give us a chance to make something um and, and to make it you know well for that tiny, tiny amount of money. Um that said, what was the original point of this story? Because I was trying to get back to <laughs> what was the original question? I forget at this point. Blooper reel? <laughs> yes. No, 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 no. Blooper yeah. reel. Well yeah. done. Okay. TJ, you're, that's it. That's literally why, why you and I are friends. Yeah. Um, okay. So wait. So we had no money for EPK, right? There was nobody there to do that, that extra footage to get a behind-the-scenes documentary of what we did. But I forgot. Greg and Howard and Bob, most specifically Bob, are whores for making sure that every single thing they ever do is on camera. Oh. Okay. Oh. By the way, if you want to know, the biggest diva in my movie was Greg Nicotero. Okay? He had this long, blonde hair at the time. He had instructed... By the way, remember, this is when Howard, Greg, and Bob all had really long hair because Greg said, we need to look like a metal band. We need to look like rock stars, not like makeup artists. And by the way, that is Greg's genius. Greg's genius was turning k &B into this thing that was larger than life. And by making these dudes look like a, you know, like a, a hair band from the 80s, um, he created something kind of spectacular. To that end, they recorded everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything, right? right? And I didn't know this. I had no idea. Well, we see some of the footage pop up every once in a while in the group. Yeah, but not, but, but not, not to like the this. extent that you guys have. No, no, no. I understand. We ha I have hours of documentary footage mm -hmm. that I didn't know existed. I actually had to watch. I had to watch myself direct at 23 years old. Wow. Like I've seen oh, footage of cool. me directing that I didn't know existed. I'm like, oh my God, where did that guy? Where's that guy? Holy crap. Like, look at that dude. Um, like, wow, I am a loud mouth. What is that? <laughs> um, and, Time machine. Uh, and, right. And so there are, there are some bloopers, unintentional bloopers, simply because you're watching footage get shot and you see some fuck ups and you see me make fun of myself. And so there's that kind of stuff. There's no like Burt Reynolds style bloopers. No. And by the way, so that everybody understands bloopers, I don't think most people do. Um, bloopers, when they put them on a movie. Uh, it's a SAG rule. You have to go back to the actors and get their permission to use bloopers. Can't just use bloopers. Mm. Not allowed. The actor has to sign off on their mistakes. Because there are some actors who are like, I don't want people seeing my mistakes. Yeah, I could. Even if it's hilarious. I don't right. yeah, yeah. I'm good. And that's really cool that like that that people are protected to some degree. But by the way, I love bloopers. I love when they're in movies. And so you want to get them if you can. But again, we never signed off for bloopers. Plus, I don't have access to the original negative. I can't mm, get that footage. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not like a digital shot movie where you know the director has access to all that. Warner Bros. Brothers has that. And they will never let it out of their clutches. Nor do I want to wake that sleeping dragon. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I got a question for you, old Adam. Oh, it's, yeah. It's yeah. Like, uh -oh. So... I know a story. I'll try to explain. You'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, the Bellissimo explosion story. Did that make it onto the bonus? Oh, you bet. Okay. Oh, you bet. Okay, good. Oh, you bet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's there. That's there. Okay. And Tom Tom actually came to my home 
uh because tom is like this now this like um ronin assassin guy you know like wandering the world tom um, Blissimo is awesome <laughs> tom Blissimo, he retired and yeah. he truly is like this like ronin who just goes from town to town i used you to know, blow stuff up blowing shit up <laughs> um, he's just like that guy now and tom came to my house and he actually was interviewed right about there mm-hmm. um uh, up on my in my library um in the same spot that i was i was uh, interviewed in and I got to tell you, like hanging out with Tom was so fun. And he talks about partially what he talks about is how much of the stuff in the movie he did for free oh. because because he and I became so close and he fell so in love with what we were doing. He's such a cool guy that he would be like, all right, we'll put on an extra hundred squibs on Kane. OK, <laughs> <laughs> I got him on the truck. I might as well use him. And oh, so okay. he he doubled and tripled the value of what we wanted in the movie to be what I what I dreamed of for the movie. And then Tom would beat it. He's that guy. He's that guy. But again, it, and and one of the things you really find out in the, in the in the in the making of this thing in the in the documentary is that you see that everybody was given such a safe place to be creative and to play and and while that was happening, my vision was so direct, was so like, this is what I want to do. Let's do this. And again, by the way, <clears throat> those people who hate the movie, I'm the guy that you can blame for it. Like, if you hate this movie, you can say, fuck Adam. Like, I got it. <laughs> and that's, and by, and listen, I'm okay with that. Like, I really am okay with that. If you don't like the scene of the, of, of, of the, the, you don't like the shaving scene, oh. I'm the guy. Oh. I'm the guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, that did not come out of the mind of Sean Cunningham. <laughs> okay. That's a very small cabin of space. So that did not come out of that. Um, I I am the guy who was like, let's upset the apple cart. Let's do something. Like, like the, the character is getting locked into this stale, you know, stalk, kill, repeat mode. That and again, by the way, what, first director to bring Angry Pickle to the franchise. Right. Yeah. Now, by the way, I do have to give, I, again, I give the credit where credit's due. Sean did bring Kevin Bacon's ass in widescreen yeah. for extended shots yeah. in the first movie. So, you know, that I can't take credit for the first real male nudity in the series. That's that Sean's. Um, but I brought equal amounts of male and female nudity, and that hadn't been done before. Um, and I pushed back against nudity that didn't make any sense to the movie as well. Where I'm like, no, man, we're not doing that. Um, and Sean would get mad at me for that. Like he was actually angry that I was trying to have some sense of dignity about a movie. And again, I know it's a Friday 13th film. I want as many boobies as makes sense. Who doesn't love <laughs> boobies, but you got to love all of it, man. Like yeah. I, t- I, I came in with, I know, and this sounds so pretentious, but it's just true. I came in with a much more European idea of what movie making was where I was like, I'm not afraid of nudity. I love it. I embrace it, but it should go in all directions, kids. Mm-hmm. All right. And yeah. a big part of our audience is teenage girls. You think right. they want to just look at boobies? They don't. No. Nope. So can we give everybody something that they're enjoying, please? Thanks. Let's do that for a change. Um, and to that end, the movie is out of its freaking mind. I know that. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> That was on purpose. I chose to do that. You know? So, yeah. Am I a madman? Okay, I'll take it. But you know who else is a madman? Wes Craven's a freaking madman. Mm. John Carpenter's a madman. Mm -hmm. Sean Cunningham is not a madman. Well, no. And that that was kind of the thing. I was like, this movie is so stuck in just the same thing happening over and over again. And then they'll go like, I know what. We'll throw in Carrie. He fights Carrie in this movie. Oh, I know. We'll put him in New York. <clears throat> By the way, <clears throat> they put him in New York for one shot. <laughs> they put him in, in Canada for a lot of it. <laughs> which is fantastic. <laughs> um, it's true. Klaus Kinski is a madman. Yes. Really right. um, uh, I, I definitely don't want to be thought of as the Klaus Kinski. <laughs> 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 wow. Oh, wow. Oh, Jesus, what a week. That, that Nepo baby. Who's Werner Herzog in, in that trouble. analogy? I am in trouble. Um, but. <laughs> oh 
That is <laughs> good, man. That is some good stuff. Uh, now we need a meme uh, of that. No, we don't. <laughs> Somebody put um, Adam's head on uh, Werner Herzog, please. Oh, oh God. Uh, <laughs> Ver Werner, Werner, I'll take. I'll take Werner. Because <laughs> that guy's really nuts. I love me some Werner Herzog. Um, any any director has to hold a gun on his cast to keep the movie from mm -hmm. being abandoned. Uh, that guy, I have such, I love him. Um, maniac. What a maniac. Um, but my issue with the franchise had, had gotten to a place where um, you know, nobody cheers for the villain in the first movie. Mm -hmm. Nobody, right? Um, so you go to see Jaws, nobody was cheering for the shark. You go to see the original Halloween. The reason it's scary is because we are with Jamie Lee. We care about her. We don't care about Michael. Michael is the monster. Michael's the boogeyman. The problem is with all these franchises, suddenly the monster is the person we're cheering for. Yeah, that that's not a, that that's no longer a horror movie, guys. It's not. It's not. It's it's an action movie. It's a supernatural movie, but it's not a horror movie. There's nothing to be afraid of anymore. Yeah. And so for me, I was like, if we can take this thing out of being the usual visage we see, if I can play all of the beats of a regular Friday 13th movie in the first eight minutes of the movie, which I do. If you get all of those beats, it's like, great, you've gotten the cliff Friday 13th movie in eight minutes. I've given you all of those gags. Audience cheer all of them. What's awesome is that once Jason gets blown up, you don't know what's coming next. And suddenly an audience gets nervous. Nervous oh. gives me a doorway to open up to getting fear out there, to getting jump scares, to getting people out of their seats. And by the end of the film, I knew Jason was going to come back. And guess what? The minute he burst through those floorboards, right? Oh, the coolest thing ever. Oh, yeah. And the whole audience <laughs> blows, right? So I'm like, great. I'm fine with you having a superhero moment. That's great. Bring it. But I will also tell you this. By that time, I had spent so long in the movie constructing three heroes, Jessica, Steven, and Creighton, that you love those people. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And now their demise is going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So... Jason doesn't just get to be the only hero of the movie. And that's mm -hmm. that's a big deal. Like, that's a different movie than what we're used to seeing out of the Friday franchise at that point. And again, I love the Friday franchise. I'm not, I'm not dumping on the franchise. I love the franchise. I was a huge fan of all those movies. I saw every one of them in the theater multiple times. But I wanted to, I wanted to start fresh. And the other part of it, look, and it's something we do explore in the doc. The first movie, the first movie, <laughs> is really about a mother who loses her son. That's the movie, right? My movie is about a father who finds his daughter. Mm, yeah. That's, it is the final Friday, because the next thing out was going to be some version of Jason versus somebody else. We all kind of knew, like, that's coming. So... This was the bookends where I was like, I want something to feel symmetrical that feels like a complete thought. And I also, look, guys, come on. I mean, I, I, I know there are people out there that are pissed that I, that I made him a... Um, really? All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I wanted to make a movie that gave the fans, especially myself, because I... Guys, I mean, when you go from part one to part two, nothing makes sense. It doesn't make sense. Oh, yeah. I mean, okay. think about it. It just Why does alive. Right. Anyway. He's not only alive, but he's thinking, he's able to drive a car, he can move bodies to and fro <laughs> around town. And and by the way, by the way, one of the things about part two that nobody no the fans don't ever want to really think about, <laughs> Jason is a jokester. Jason's oh. hilarious. That backwoods, <laughs> that backwoods elephant man in the cabin, he's hilarious because he does things like this. I'm going to hide the head next to the milk. Wait for it. Just wait. Oh, yeah. And then, and then <laughs> I'm going to make my mommy's murderer. I'm going to give her a lot of time. But when she goes to the fridge, <laughs> you got punked. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. by the way, it's a great scene. 
It's a great sequence. Steve Miner did a beautiful job with that movie. I, I actually love, for my money, part six has always been my favorite. Tommy is the man. Love Tommy. Okay. Oh, my God. Like, we're close friends. I adore him. Buckley kicks um, he's He's an amazing dude. So part six is my favorite. Part two is my second favorite. Jason Goes to Hell is my third. So I put myself three in my own list. Okay. Wow. But here's the thing. Part two, that opening, you go, what? Like that, what? Yeah. So if you think for two minutes about who Jason Voorhees is, you go, boy, this guy is quite the comedian for a monosyllabic hydrocephalic tector. Hmm. Yeah. Well, even in part three, he takes off the mask to scare. Right. And, to oh, scare yeah. someone. Yeah. <laughs> booga, 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 booga. <laughs> Yeah, what is he, Freddy? <laughs> <laughs> he does it again in part eight, if you remember, with the, the yeah. You know? So yeah, he is sort and, of a jokester in those ones. So and <laughs> and that was the thing. Like I wanted to bring it back to scary. I wanted to bring it back to unexpected, and I wanted to give us some context because, by the way, by making him by making him part of the Evil Dead, not a deadite. There we go, folks. Here we go. And yes. I love, yes, is it. <laughs> I love I, and I by the way, I love when people do this. I love when people are like, listen, the rules of a deadite. I'm like, hey, listen, dickwad, unless you're <laughs> Sam Raimi, please don't talk to me about the rules of a deadite. That's please a stop. Point. Okay. And uh, <laughs> didn't you get the book from Sam? So uh, I sure did. Yeah. So uh, sure yeah. did. <laughs> um, he was happy, happy to put it in a Ziploc bag uh, and hand it to me, and that's how it came. Uh, bingo. Um, so look, I, 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 by doing that, I gave Jason some reason for being some, and I know, I know some people like mm, you went nine movies. You don't want to have any, any questions answered. <laughs> Nothing really. Yeah. You just want to watch the same fucking thing again? And again, you've got plenty of those to watch. So watch them. Love them. I love them and I rewatch them. But for the love of God, let's do something different. There's more than one book. There's at least three books in the Evil Dead mythology. That's right. I think Evil Dead Rise showed us that. The, the different books have a different effect on people. Yep. That's not to say one particular page causes this particular... Exactly. Exactly. And she was trying to raise her son from the dead at the bottom of Crystal Freakin' Lake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for me, <clears throat> the idea that, that, that once Jason is unbound from human rules, yeah. suddenly anything is possible. And I buy all of the movies. Oh, all of a sudden guys. the morphing thing makes sense. Everything uh -oh. makes sense. Yeah. So point. even part eight makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Apple head getting, you know, turned into mush. <laughs> I buy it. And then the mush comes back. Got it. So yeah. it, it just allows everything to be um, more honest and more connected and more real for the audience for, for, from a scare point of view. So that's what it came down to. I love it. I actually have a question. There oh, we I go. Wow. Yeah, right. yeah. Bloody you better speak up. Um, throughout the majority of the interviews that you did, obviously with the cast and crew, was there one interview that really surprised you or that person talking about their experience working on set? Was there that one person yeah. that sort of was like, holy shit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the person that surprised me the most out of everybody <clears throat> um, was Julie Michaels. Um, Agent Marcus, which by the way, I did not name her Agent Marcus. A lot of people think like I put that <laughs> name on her. I did not. That was a Sean Cunningham gag. Sure, Adam. Uh, sure. And, no, <laughs> sure. and I'll tell you why, because I named the county Cunningham County, which he was annoyed uh, by. Yeah. So then he made it Agent Marcus. Um, so okay. And he was in cahoots with Jimmy Gleason because he's the one who says, Good work, Agent Marcus. Um, and I that was not in the script. At Sean oh, told oh. Jimmy to do that. And then as we cut, I was like, cut, who the hell told him to do And Sean was like, hey, 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 hey. I'm like, all right, kid. So, um, but Julie told a story on set that, um, I, that I couldn't believe. Um, she was going to leave the industry. Julie was not going to work anymore. Um, she had been so harassed and so mistreated on other movies roadhouse um yeah and she had she had had some not roadhouse because she had a good experience with that but but she had had some really really dark 
dark experiences um, and almost assaultive. Ooh. And she went to Pee Wee, um, who is her uh, husband, um, wasn't then, they were dating then. And he was the one who told her to take her, um, her power back. Um, and they started training so that she could not only be a dancer, which she already was, but to really be the badass that she ended up being on my set. When she came in to interview for me, I had to do a body check, which is the weirdest thing in the world. Like, that is just weird um, and, uh, and uncomfortable. I, I hate stuff like that, but you do have to do it. It's part of the job. Um, and so we, we did that and, um, and, and she noted like that I was always respectful of her, that I was always in a place of like wanting her to feel safe and wanting her to be taken care of. And we got to set and that moment of running in, uh, with bare feet where she tore her feet up <clears throat> and, um, and I saw I said, you know, we need to go one more time, one more time around. And she was like, no problem, boss. I got it. She always called me boss. Um, and as she walked away from me, I was like, Julie, you're all right. And she's like, no, no, I'm good, boss. I'm good. And I looked at her feet and there was blood on the ground behind her. Wow. And I said, Julie, stop. I said, look, show me your feet. Come on. And so she raised one of her feet up and it was cut up. And immediately... She said, she was like, I'm fine. And she starts walking to set. And suddenly I scooped her up off of her feet into my arms and I walked her off set to a medic oh, to take care of her. And she said that that experience is so crazy. She said that that experience in that moment in particular, she made a decision to stay in the industry. Um, it was that moment that she went, oh, there are people with humanity and there are people who will love me and protect me. And I had no, I, you know, there, there was no, and there's never been on my sets, but there was no sexual harassment. There was no sense of me trying to break bounds. It wasn't like, yep. it, and it wasn't that. It was, I was actually like, no, you're under my care when you're on my set. And I take full responsibility for making sure you are safe and okay. And I carried her off set, got her to the medic. She was patched up. We put booties on her, which of course you can see in a couple shots. I know people love to jump on that. <laughs> fine, fine, fine. If I can keep an actor safe and you see a little mistake, I don't give a shit. Um, I do not go with the, you know, pain is fleeting, film is forever. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> um, nobody has to be in pain to make a movie. Um, but she... Um, she decided at that point that the stunt route was the route for her, that she really wanted to pursue that more because it did give her power. It did make her feel stronger. And now, Julie, when we shot her even, there are literally um, Emmys behind her because she is an Emmy-winning stunt coordinator. Wow. Um, and that her path on our movie shifted and went to this place where she got to do beautiful work with her husband, who she's still running her company with. Um, and by the way, Julie, uh, Julie's daughter is an amazing actress and so stunning. Like, you're like, what the hell? I mean, Julie is beautiful. Her daughter is her and a bag of chips. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. And like, Julie is such a proud mom. It's just like the most adorable. The two of them together are incredible. But I got to tell you, like, um, Julie is one of those people we hadn't seen each other in years. We, we've seen each other over the years. We hadn't seen each other. Adam in Knightley's in the comments. Oh, Knightley, my man. My man. Oh, Knightley's amazing. Knightley was our youngest uh, executive producer before yes. Lydia showed up. Um, but Knightley, not, by the way, Knightley <laughs> is making great films right now. Knightley's a student filmmaker right now, mm -hmm. and he is killing it. Like he is, he is somebody to watch for guys. He nightly, nightly Giamo is going to be making movies. Um, this guy is, uh, he is the freaking man. That is awesome. Nightly. It's so good to see you there, brother. Um, so yeah, Julie, I hadn't seen in a long time. And I got to tell you when, when we got on set together, um, there's a moment and there's photographs. We didn't, we didn't take video of it, but there's photographs of it. Um, of she ran out of her house into the street to hug me. And we were literally hugging for probably about two, two and a half minutes. Wow. 
Wow. Um, because you just, there is this kinship. Um, and that happened with, with a number of people on this movie. It's crazy. Like the, 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 the love that people had for each other, Andy Block, um, you know, who, who, who plays, um, the deputy in the movie, um, deputy Josh, the melting man, um, Andy Block is making a documentary about his, uh, his beautiful son who was in a, a terrible accident and changed forever because of it. Um, he's still with us, which is wonderful. His, his, his life was spared in this, in this accident, but, um, but Andy is making this beautiful documentary. And because of him coming back to set to see me for the documentary, Andy suddenly was like, hey, would you look at this documentary I'm working on? And now I'm helping Andy with this documentary for the last year. And it's this incredible piece about this beautiful boy and Andy's love for his son. It's amazing. So again, there were all these times when like these remarkable artists would show up and then we like we rekindled a, a creative relationship and just started working together immediately again. So it's all of that guys. It's, it's uh, and the movie really does, does um, allow for those things, allow for the kind of greatness of these stories. And so Julie's moment, I will tell you Brody, every, every person on set, by the time she finished, she was crying and all of us were crying. And we yep. were ridiculous. Like we started laughing at the end, and we're like, "Okay, this is, we're making a, a documentary about a horror movie. We're all crying. What is going on?" Um, but it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. I can't wait to see it. It's going to be something Thanks. special. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's it's great. It's great. Hell yeah. Good. All right. Anybody else got questions? Yes. Let's, Let's see. Do it. Uh, I think somebody asked a Jason goes to hell related questions. You could Go probably ask what was the hardest part of making that film. What was the hardest part of making that movie? Yes. Sean Cunningham. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, by the way, look, look, you know, everybody knows there was a, a whole thing between Carrie Keegan and I, that is not in the movie, by the way, it is not. Um, I, 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 we had footage on it. I didn't want it. Um, because I, I don't, uh, again, there is talk of how certain production things were affected by problems between me and Carrie, but we don't go into that, into that, that beef um, because Carrie and I buried the hatchet and she's got a whole different life. She's not in the, in the industry anymore. And she's, you know, living a beautiful life with her respect the incredible values. family. And yes, and I respect her. Um, so God bless. Um, but I will tell you, um, look, getting up every day and going to set to a guy who, um, It was just bitter. Bitter's hard. Like when someone goes bitter, that is a hard thing to be around. And he didn't understand, as I said earlier about the whole like, you know, film student thing. Like he he hated. Okay. Okay. So is that great shot in the movie? And I say it's a great shot. You guys might disagree, but I love the shot. There's the shot where John LeMay shows up to the Voorhees house for the first time. He sees it for the first time. And the, you see his eyes and then, right. And then you go behind his back and we crane down and the house looms, yep. right? Okay. So I shot that. Sean right. watched me shoot that and went behind my back, looked at me and went, fucking film school. Uh, that was his response to that shot. Now, we're at the very first screening of the movie, right? We're at the very first screening of the film, which was done uh, at, uh, at USC, right? So we had a lot of college students there and a lot of other people. We had a full audience. And Peter Brackey was in the audience. Okay. Um, Peter was still like, he, I think he was 22 at the time. So he and I were very close in age. And he's the asshole who said, I'd like to see more campers by the camp getting killed. He's the reason. <laughs> Peter Brackey is the reason I had to go make extra shoot, shooting stuff. By the way, God bless him. He was right. And I love that sequence in the movie. So awesome. And it's the best kill in the franchise. But that moment happens where the house goes like this. The entire audience, the whole place goes, ooh. <laughs> the whole room. I'm sitting there to so Sean. I turned to him. I said, huh, must be a lot of film students in here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, the hardest thing about making Jason goes to hell was Sean. Because I got to tell you something. Nothing else was hard. Yeah. Nothing else from a filmmaking standpoint. I was having, I was a kid in a candy store. I loved it. I had amazing actors. I had great technicians. 
I mean, yes, we had our struggles day to day. You have to win the battle of each day when you're making a movie. But I have to tell you, I was never like, God, how am I going to make my day? I'm totally screwed. No, man, I loved it. I love, yes, Peter Brackey, Eric Hyde is right. 100%. Bless you, Peter Brackey. You're right. He is, he is, by the way, he pushed me then and he pushed me while I'm making the documentary. He is, he is one of my favorite people. I fucking adore Peter Brackey. He's an amazing guy. Amazing guy. So while we're loving on Jason Goes to Hell for a little bit. I love it. Uh, upon Please. recent rewatches, and I was talking to Brody about this the other day, yeah. the scene where Steven and the cop, well, your brother, My brother. Are, yeah. Yeah. are fighting yeah. alongside the road, the dialogue exchange is so fantastic. Thank you. It is so good. And that's such an underappreciated scene. Thank it's you. just so damn good. Do you have any good stories about that scene particularly? Yeah, that that's actually the scene I shot uh, for my director's test. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's you see scene. that in the commentary. Yes, that's you do. the scene. Yeah, yes. that's the scene. Um, uh, that was the one because it didn't have a lot of effects. It, it, I could shoot it for nothing. And New Line, New Line basically wanted to see, like, can he work with actors, which was so weird because my student film at NYU uh, so you like this girl that stars Tom Lennon and Joe Latruglio. Um, that movie won awards all over the place and it won NYU. It was best picture at New York, you know, at, at the most prestigious film school in the world. It was the, it was the movie. Mm -hmm. um, but New Line was like, but can he work with actors? I'm like, I don't, um, <laughs> yeah, what? So, uh, so we did that. We shot that scene. Um, Bill Dill was my cinematographer mm -hmm. on that, on that day, which is amazing. He showed up for free to shoot my fucking, you know, <laughs> my test. Um, and uh, the funny thing is neither John nor Kip were cast at that point. So I was really shooting with two other actors who did an incredible job for me, um, but were wrong for the feature. That really didn't fit the movie the way I wanted to do it, but they were great to come in to do the test mm -hmm. and they got paid for the day. Um, uh, SAG wages. So that was, that was awesome. Um, but that scene evolved every time I shot it because I had to reshoot it. It's one of the only scenes in the movie that got shot twice. Mm. I did have to reshoot that scene. Um, my brother, uh, had just graduated NYU, uh, acting school, um, where he won something called the circle award. There was only one person in five schools of acting at NYU who wins that award one. Uh, and it's either a man or a woman but there's only one and he won that award. It's, it's the most prestigious award you can win at, at NYU. The problem is my brother saw himself as a young John Turturro. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, dude, what are you doing? And at one point I remember Sean, Sean walked up to me and goes, can your brother act like a person? <laughs> and I was like, uh, I don't know. Can you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I was so lippy with Sean by the middle of the movie. I was like, ah, oh, fuck off, <laughs> fuck off, you piece of. Um, but, but with Kip, with Kip, he really was kind of going for this this tone that was not the movie. Yeah. Um, and I truly like. I saw the I saw the rushes on the movie. I was like, this is not working. This is not working. <laughs> um, the other thing is John Lemay. John Lemay was just as bad as Kip. So John. Um, uh, when I brought John in, I was like, listen, um, he said, you know, who is Steven like? I said, he's a jackass. He's a ne'er-do-well. Like, he's this guy who was, a, you know, star of the of the basketball team in high school and is literally sitting at a bar, or in this case, a diner, um, <laughs> talking about the glory days of, of high school. Like, he's he's stuck. He's a stuck guy. And he said, okay, I get that. Like, that's interesting. He says, but, like, what kind of guy? I was like... I, I said, think Bruce Willis in Die Hard. I want a smart ass, wise talking son of a bitch. Like I want that guy in the movie, right? And John heard that as, I would really love you to play Hamlet. Oh. <laughs> so suddenly I have dueling thespians on my set. And the two of them are looking for the darkness in the scene. I'm like, guys, there's no darkness. It's funny. Like, <laughs> Yeah. I'm doing I'm doing a John Woo standoff by the cop car and everybody's got guns. Like it's it's <laughs> it's funny and the stakes are one guy's got to get to Jessica. That's it. Like the whole thing is about the hero protecting the girl. 
and he'll do whatever it takes to get to her. So he lets his best friend from high school cuff him. And so that scene, um, we, we, I shot it. Um, that scene ended up being exactly the scene I wanted because both guys eventually, I let them look at some of the rushes and they were like, oh, that's not, no, that doesn't work. I'm like, do you see what I'm saying? And I never let actors look at their rushes. I never allow it. It's a bad practice because actors invariably change stuff and you don't want them to change stuff. It's like, no, no, no. If the performance is working, let's go. But the performance wasn't working. We shot that scene early. And I just was like, guys, we got to get this right. And they really, they really got it right. And by the way, I love that someone's, uh, that Eric is talking about the fight and how hilarious it is. What's awesome about those two guys is that they did all that fighting at the car by themselves. Like I didn't bring in stunt people for it or anything. And the whole movie is stunted. Not that scene. Such a physical scene. It's so physical. And the head butt and all of it, where they both hurt themselves, by the way, like that moment where they, where, where they head butt each other and they're both in pain. That is totally my kind of storytelling mm-hmm. when it comes to action and comedy. It's like, because anybody who's ever actually been headbutted, I I love how people always think like, you know, Roadhouse. (laughs) It's like you headbutt somebody, your head feels shitty too. Like nobody walks away from a headbutt going like, I really got that guy. Oh shit. (laughs) You know, it's, um, and, and so everything in the movie, I wanted the, I wanted the pain of everything to be real. And in that moment, it was like this really funny thing. It was just Mm -hmm. funny. And it also let a little bit of steam out, which had to happen at that point in the movie. Like, yes. I'm moving like a freight train up till then. And it's so much that I went, I want to give the audience a moment to giggle. Like, let them have a laugh. The other thing is, we're about to go into Robert's, you know, siege at the, at the police station. And I'm like, I need to just have a moment of laughter to remember how much we love these heroes. How much we love these guys, these idiots. Before the real shit hits the fan yeah. because once we get into the police station proper, that's it. There's no more joking around. It is. We're even with, you know, Rusty and Leslie at the, at the, at the uh, diner, you know, there's moments of comedy in there, but it's tension comedy because even Ward, you know, pulling the gun out, you know, all that stuff. He's, he's going to get murdered. We know he's, uh, you know, walking into his own slaughter. So at that point, the laughs are more like, <laughs> oh shit oh no so i i needed that scene in particular to kind of allow us to breathe for a second so it's a really important scene yeah yeah, yeah. that one and uh my favorite scene in the movie it is my favorite um is the scene between john lemay and adam craner in the back of the diner mm. when ward gives steven his car keys um because when when we shot that scene and I remember my, my cinematographer, Bill Dill, he, he talks about it in the movie, he talks about it in the doc. But he said to me, he was like, man, you don't see this kind of scene in these movies, like ever. I was like, nope, you don't. I was like, this is two guys telling us everything about who they are as human beings in two minute scene, in a short scene. Um, that literally has the most ridiculous thing in the movie. Like the single most ridiculous thing in Jason Goes to Hell is in that scene. Because I put a baby in a box. There's a baby in a cardboard Del Monte Pears box in the back of that, 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 that kitchen. And no one has ever been like, why is the baby in a box? Everybody buys it because the emotion between those two men is so honest, is so lovely. And that moment with Ward where you just go like, wow. Oh, that was done on purpose. I attributed to that you being 23 and just putting a baby in a... Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Rusty, Rusty says, go, 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 get a box or something. Put a, put the baby in a box. Yeah. She says that, and I was like, oh, no, the baby has to be in a box now. Like, now... Uh, a the, literal the, box. The funniest character in the movie has said, get a box for the baby. So we got a box, something you would put a kitten in, and we put a live baby in a box. It's ridiculous, but it's funny. It's really funny. Um, and again, look, if, if, uh, if Rusty Schwimmer says something in a movie, you have to actually do the thing that was said. Yeah. That's, just, that's just a rule I, I live by. 
And yes, Eric, it is a very underrated Manfredini score. That opening with the uh, that yeah. kid's toy, that yes, that is just so haunting. And I don't know if you guys know that ding, ding, that's happening in the intro is him running it along a chain link fence and then smacking it. Uh, mm. Yeah, a rod against it. There's uh, an entire um, uh, thing on the on the disc. Uh, he has another short film about Harry. And the score on the on the disc itself so it's underrated, pretty pretty terrific, pretty terrific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great score. And Harry, look, it's Harry for God's sakes. Dun 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 dun. dun. <laughs> yes, fills my fills my dreams. <laughs> it really does. Bro, do you got a question? I do actually. Yes, um, it. because it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie and one of my favorite deaths in the whole entire franchise. What was the process? Uh, process a lot going through directing uh the josh death scene so Ooh. that body horror scenario i'd love it that was great it was great um the uh so that sequence um which by the way i was so i was so excited for and and look that's um that's the danger of putting bob kurtzman and i together in a room um Bob, Bob was really my guy on set. Bob was the, was the um, second unit director of, of Jason Goes to Hell. And he has that credit in the movie. Um, and of course, you know, only a, a year and a half later, Bob directs his first feature, The Demolitionist, right after, mm -hmm. right after Jason Goes to Hell. Um, Bob, uh, Bob is, is, I have a kinship with Bob, like very few others in this world. Um, and uh, Bob just did Secret Santa for yes. me. Um, which is, you know, live on screen box, get screen box. Um, but, uh, Bob is amazing. Um, amazing guy and has a similar sense of humor and a similar sense of, of grotesque that I have. And the two of us, when you put us in a room together, I remember Sean at one point looked at the two of us. We were, we were, we had like action figures on a table and we're like trying to act out things that were going to happen. And he literally was like, two idiots in a sandbox and i'm like yes the best two idiots you ever hired john we'll um running. because we would come up with these concepts and then immediately bob would sketch something give it to john bisson john bisson would start to sketch that out then it would go to howard and greg and howard would get a team together to start building the thing um so with the melting man my whole concept from day one was that Jason's evil is so concentrated, is so it's so much. And by the way, that comes from um, Time Bandits. So anybody who's a fan of Time Bandits, the moment where the parents touch the piece of evil at the end, and and their son says, "No, no, it's too evil," and they both explode. That was the concept for Jason's evil. I was like, "There's just a nugget of that concentrated evil that is Jason that will eventually destroy the host that it's in." Right. So he has to keep looking for more other bodies because the body is just going to, it's just going to melt. So I said to them, I want him to melt. And they were like, you want him to what? And Bob was like, fucking awesome. Okay. We're going to melt it. <laughs> and so the two of us started figuring out and we drew, we did a lot of drawings of that. Um, Jeffrey Lynch, who's a fantastic um, director on The Simpsons. He's one. Of, he was one of The Simpsons' lead directors. He was my storyboard artist on Jason Goes to Hell, and so he was the one who would painstakingly draw these ideas with me and Bob to figure out how I was going to manipulate it and shoot it and all of that. What's great about K and B and what they were really brilliant at was hiring stunt performers or um, contortionists to play characters in the makeups so that the makeups could get treated in a different way. And also so that you wouldn't get bulky people because when you put makeup on top of an actor, it just makes them bulkier. But if you take a thinner actor to double that other actor, suddenly it's not bulky. It's the shape of that original actor. And that's what we did with Josh. Now, by the way, a lot of the, a lot of the melting man is Josh is, is Andy block. And he's wonderful in that makeup. He does a great job. Um, and remember, Andy is also the one he and my brother are both the only two actors to have to have the snake tongue, the, you know, the parasite that comes out of their mouths. Mm -hmm. So Andy had the full servo and he, he was really good with working those effects. Like he knew how to play that stuff by that point. But <clears throat> The, the melting man 
was, I think it was six entire makeups for that sequence. And each one you get progressively smaller and smaller. So we brought another, uh, we brought in a, a performer to play Andy's character in the last moments of that, where we could shrink him down, shrink him down, shrink him down. Yep. Um, what was my favorite thing about that particular scene from my standpoint, um, not just in shooting it, but in prepping it, I was so involved with the, with the effects. And by the way, I was at KNB daily. I was at the shop, not when we were shooting, but in pre-production, I was there all the time. It's where I love to be. Um, and it's why, you know, they, at the end of production, they gave me a K and B crew jacket, which I still have in my closet, um, that has my name on it. And they don't, they don't give those to directors, but they were like, you've been here every day of this movie. You're part of the team. Like you helped make all of this with us. Cause I, that's where I started. Makeup effects was really where, where, where I started as, as a 13 year old. So we um, were shooting it and I kept yelling for more blood. I need more pus on that wall. He's got to drip more. And um, Howard made a pair of saddlebags for me, this leather, these leather pouches of saddlebags. And one pouch was full of pus and the other pouch was full of blood. And Howard, and there were ladles in both of them. And Howard said, Great, dress your set. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> And man, I was like, yeah, and I start flinging pus around this room. I was having, I'm telling you, I, uh, again, kid in a candy store. So that sequence in particular, I was covered in stuff because I was really in it. Right. Um, I'm not a clean director. Like I'll take a shower. Um, I'd rather like, I'd rather get spattered with everything. Like then I know my audience is going to get spattered with it. So um, so I'm in the shit when I'm doing it and it was, uh, it was a mess and it was glorious. I feel like a kid finger painting. Like it was so like wrong <laughs> and awesome. It was awesome. I loved it. Loved it. Okay. So as we start to wrap things up here, uh, there's a lot of people asking questions about a release date. So yes. we don't have a firm release date as no. of yet. As Adam mentioned earlier, we are in the final stages of completing the film. It's at legal right now. Yep. So, and it's being shopped around. Like he said, there's people interested. We're not, we can't say all who's interested, but right. there's people interested. So once that deal's done, then you guys can get your Blu-rays. Then you yes. guys can see the movie and all that. It's, it's, it's just, it's a process and we don't, like Adam said earlier, we don't want to rush this. There's a certain way to do these things and we're going to do it right. We also don't look guys. I, I can tell you this from, from experience of, of being an independent producer. We don't want this thing to get caught on a Russian bot site. And next thing you know, the whole world has a copy of this movie yes. already. Yep. And that's not, that's not what we're doing. We don't, I, I don't, I don't work that way. No, no one should work that way. It destroys films. Um, and it destroys the chance for it to be on legitimate services where yes. you guys can stream the thing the right way. Um, so look, the way this works is we're at legal. Once we're signed off with legal, which should only be a, about a week or two, um, it goes to final color correction and sound mix and we're done because the movie's locked. The movie's done. So th at that point, we'll start pressing Blu-rays but at the same time, it's going out to festivals. So you guys, I'm hoping that most of you are going to get to see this movie for the first time on a big screen, not on a little screen. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get this to everybody's home. I want to get this all over the place. And I've reserved next year to go touring with this movie to conventions, to festivals, to all of it, and hang out with y'all. Like, actually be together with the people who help make this movie. At that point, once it's done that, that's when everybody's getting digital mm -hmm. copies. That's when everybody's getting the Blu-ray. That's when you guys get all the goodies. So people will see the movie, and then you guys are the only ones that are actually going to see all the goodies. So mm -hmm. all the extras, all the extra footage, all that stuff, that ends up in your hands. Which we mentioned earlier is an extra two hours of footage. Yep. So you're getting double if you are a backer. Yep. Plain and simple. You're getting twice as much shit as everybody. Anyone who goes see it in the theater is going to get a movie and a damn good movie. Anyone who backed this campaign is going to be getting double what everybody else gets. Like some of the and stories we hinted at earlier. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Told by much prettier people than me. <laughs> 
And like I said in the comments, if you scan the QR code in the top left corner, that will link you to Streambox and Secret Santa. Ah, oh, you're the man. You rock, dude. Thank you for that. That's beautiful. Yes. Love that. Love that. So if we have any final questions, please put them in the comment section now as we wrap things up. And I want to thank Brandon and Brody for joining us today. Thank you guys. Awesome having you guys here. That was amazing. That was such a nice surprise for me. Yeah, no, uh, thank you for having us. Like, it's an honor to be here with you, man. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. And again, how can we have the bearded guy club if there aren't bearded yes. guys here? So, you know, <laughs> God this, is now, this is now a brotherhood. Come on. There we go. <laughs> Don't make me make a t shirt. Uh, <laughs> I'll make you make that t shirt. <laughs> by the, hey, by the way, there. just on a, on, a, on a, oh, Ruben, my man, Ruben Morales. Uh, by the way, Ruben who I went to Monster Palooza with, we shared a booth there yes. where I showed a few minutes of footage that no one had seen before. Um, you had to come to the to, to Monster Palooza to see it live. Um, but we I will be I will be releasing that stuff soon uh, for, for everybody to see. Um, but uh, but Ruben Ruben is you know responsible for a ton of the uh, the, the perks that happened with the campaign. And yes. he's in the, he's in the movie. The um, he's actually online for the 30th anniversary uh, screening of the movie. Um, no, Ruben, Ruben and I have become brothers. It's amazing. And Ru by the way, Ruben um, is is his company Villains in Love. Yes, that's yes. that's one of the kind. Yes, yes. But Ruben was um, he. I was at Son of Monster Palooza showing the trailer for Secret Santa. This is in 2017. And Ruben comes up to me um, and he's holding uh, a, a chrome mask and a dagger that he had printed, that he had he, he, he had made. He had sculpted and then printed. And he's behind me. And I didn't see him, right? I'm just talking with my my, my cast. And Michelle Renee Allaire, who's the, one of the leads of Secret Santa, she, she goes, uh, Adam, there's, uh, there's somebody back there. And I turn around and there's Ruben holding these two things. He's like, um, and by the way, Ruben is like um, so tall, he blots out the sun. <laughs> and so this like this, this mountain of a person is standing behind me. And he says, um, I, I was wondering, could you, uh, could you sign these? And I was like, dude, yeah like oh my god these are beautiful by the way the the the, the daggers are the actual dagger that became part of the campaign years later like those are the same oh, daggers right so i signed both these items and he's like uh can i take a picture of you i was like let me take a picture of me and i handed the camera to his wife and i said get in here come on come on, come on. <laughs> and i help and the two of us are there his wife starts sobbing Wow. And she says to my wife and to my my team who's with me for Super Saiyan, she goes, he's this has just been a lifelong dream of his to me. And I was like, You're kidding me. <laughs> me? That's a lifelong dream? Like, dream bigger, dude. But <laughs> but I will tell you, from that moment, we became friends. And that's the thing about the fandom that I that, the fandom and the the people that you know that sign the autographs mm -hmm. it's look it's great to go to a convention it's great that people pay you for your autograph and all that stuff and i'm i, I think everybody needs to make a living i get it but i have to tell you something i don't understand when people in my position don't actually want to make relationships with the people that are excited about their work like it fandom's great and i love fans but I don't want people to be like this. There are some people that I'm thrilled like this, especially, you know, the ones who hate me. Um, but the ones, people who love these movies, <clears throat> I love these movies. We're all the same. Like we, I'm, I'm just the guy who directed the movie, but I want to be close to the people out there that love this stuff. Um, I want to be approachable. I don't want people to be afraid to come and talk to me. Come and talk to me. Don't be a dick, but come and talk to me. Um, that's important. That's that's an important thing. And I don't understand the separation that happens that becomes this sort of us and them thing. I hate that shit. Um, Ruben and I are close friends. Ruben's a brilliant artist. Brilliant. Um, and he was a guy who was brave enough to just come up to me and not when I was at a booth, not when I, he just came up and said, 
hey, I love what you do. You start a conversation with me like that, we're good. We're going to be good to go. Well, hang And on. there is one person we haven't mentioned yet. Oh, yes, or shouted please. out. Uh, Corey Kaufman. Has I did. Been, I did we, earlier. We, we mentioned him, but we haven't. He's been an instrumental part to this whole project. Absolutely. Visually, Absolutely. he made all of our ideas come to life. He is a class act and a fantastic artist. Thank you, Corey, for all the time. He's an and amazing effort. artist. He's an amazing artist. And and by the way, like forget about just the fact that so many of the the perks were were designed, you know, were drawn and designed by Corey. It, it's not just that. Corey and TJ are the reason this whole thing happened. They're the reason, okay? Because they made the Jason Goes to Hand Hell the final uh, fan page happen at, for a birthday gift for me on my <laughs> birthday years ago. They're the reason. They're the ones who opened my eyes because I didn't want to make this doc. I didn't want to do it. I, I didn't. I was. I was like, oh come on, guys, who wants this? People really we want do. this, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And by the way, by by creating that fan page and showing me the community that was out there that did mm -hmm. want this, I was like, well fuck then yeah then there's a reason to make this and that got me excited guys <clears throat> filmmakers out there and i know a ton of people who are here now are, are filmmakers never make something you're not a hundred percent passionate about because you will make something shitty and you will have make final a cut what yeah and have final cut yeah right okay <laughs> 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 yes, if you make it yourself, you, if you shoot it on your iPhone, you have all the that you want. Um, but no, I, I, I got to tell you, if you if you don't, if you aren't passionate, you won't make something worthwhile. You won't make something worth worth people spending their money on and spending their time on. And we we as filmmakers, you know, we have to be inspired. And the truth is, TJ and Corey is how I got inspired to make this thing happen. And there's nothing more important than that. That is, they are the muses of this piece. The, Thank you. It's, true. For the clap it's just true. Yeah. And by the way, to that end, <laughs> everyone who's on here, everyone who supported this thing, everyone who gave whatever a little amount they could give to get the thing made, um, everyone who who spent time when Ali and I were live endlessly, yeah. endlessly. Or watch one of my videos whenever I was promoting yes. the thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, Thank you. There, there, there is, I, I, I owe all of you a debt of gratitude for, for putting the gas in my tank. And I don't mean that by, by the money. I mean that by the energy of the, of the piece there look every every person out there who makes movies or or is an artist of any kind if you paint something if you write a symphony if you write a rap song whatever it is when one person says something kind when one person says that made me feel great when i listened to that when i looked at that painting i had this emotional experience that reminded me of my childhood when people have that kind of response for people like me mm -hmm. that is literally what we live on because Lord knows we do not get paid a lot. We just don't. <laughs> we we do this for the love of doing it. And if that's what you're being, if that's what your being is about, when people give you just that little bit of encouragement and that sense that like what you're doing matters to me, guys, I'm telling you, there is nothing better. And there is nothing that fuels a project or a filmmaker more than that. That's what it's about. Well, I think there's that, that there's the way that's the way to end the uh, the live stream, folks. Thank you for sitting with us for the nearly two hours that we've been live. We yeah. have been consistently having people in and out. It's awesome to see all you Hellions showing amazing. up to this event. It's it is really amazing. cool. Yeah. Yes, it, it kind of justifies that. Hey, after what four years of production, you guys are still here with us. <laughs> yeah. Hey, to, to, I will say, who would have foretold that COVID would have hit us? Oh, uh, right. No, we, sure. we literally yeah. lost. Here's the thing. People think you lost like a year. No, I couldn't get into people's houses for two and a half years, guys. It was two yeah. and a half years. L.A. is not like the rest of the world. L.A. was no. like nobody's going nowhere <laughs> and everybody's going to be wearing masks and everybody's going to have to be social distanced. 
I have photographs when we shot Michelle Clooney's house. We all came in with, with masks. Yeah. We took them off. We were in her backyard. We are all, I'm like 14 feet away from Michelle. Oh. We had to use longer lenses to do our interviews so that we could <laughs> be not further kidding. away. That's not <laughs> a joke. <laughs> I'm literally doing that to keep distance so that people are safe. So we we did everything by COVID protocols, but it was at a snail's pace because the, who the hell thought, oh, the plague is going to happen? <laughs> yeah. You know? But it did. Yeah. And by the way, we never, ever once said we're not going to get this done. Nope. Just keep pushing ahead. Adapt we kept moving. Come. Kept moving. Yep. Yeah. Hundred percent. And look, we also we replaced our director. I mean, guys, we. Oh my god. You know it's what? The, the making of this documentary has had just as an interesting yeah. making <laughs> as the movie we're talking about. Dude. Yeah. And when, it and is way, insane. When you, when you consider what happened in December last year mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania, and that's where we were supposed to shoot the end of the yep. doc. And how that blew up? Yep. I mean, you talk about a oh, future uh, documentary. No, of course you brought it up. Why would you do that? <laughs> Holy <No>. crap. <laughs> uh, that might be a whole other doc. Me stuck in a hotel room going live to the fans going like, okay, we're going to meet in a coffee house and I'll sign <laughs> in. It's like, it's like, what is happening? Yeah. And Kane Hodder going like, Adam. Do I have to hurt somebody? I'm like, I wish you would. <laughs> <laughs> and now's the time, Kane. You know, release the hound. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's been all, folks. Thanks for joining us. See you guys, well, at the dock. Love you guys.